I'm Andrew Richardson. I was born in Folkestone. I'm director of Isle Heritage. We're based in the town and I'm an archaeologist. I've, for many years I've studied and worked in Folkestone and working on its history and archaeology, including the history of moving water about. Hi, I'm Beverly Taylor from Affinity Water. I'm sustainability manager based here in Folkestone. I've been with the company about 16 years and luckily got to work with Andrew a few years back on a really interesting project, Finding St Ian Swiss, that looked at the history of water and the challenges that we had then and still have today. You know, there's a very, very long story in Folkestone of water supply and moving water over long distances so it's, it's a really great place to come and think about the importance of water uh, to the human existence and also engineering to get the water where you want it to be. So where are we Andrew and Beverly? Well we're just approaching Castle Hill which is a 12th century fortification that overlooks Folkestone. A lot of locals will know it as Caesar's camp as I did when I was a kid but actually it's, it's got nothing to do with Caesar or the Romans, it's medieval. And we're also looking down into the, the coombe where between Castle Hill and what I would call Cherry Garden Hill, which is where there's a lot of historic waterworks to do with the supply of water, fresh water, drinking water, to the people of Folkestone. And Beverly, what does that sign say? That says Castle Hill and it's just a brief explanation of some of the things you could have seen here in the past as well as some of the ecology. And habitat. So it says Folkestone Downs framed Castle Hill. Oh gosh, we, we've got a gate in front of us, Andrew. Yeah, it's just uh, one of these gates stops the cattle getting out and things like that. So, Right, I'll just go through, thank you, yeah. and we'll uh, shut it behind us. Whoa, there we go. And Beverly, perhaps we can start walking now, but we can hear the cars and traffic and emergency vehicles going past on the road but if we just walk a little bit and look over the edge of this hill what do we see? You can see from up here we're actually stood on the chalk grassland right now um, and this is where our water comes from underneath here is all the aquifers and laid out before us is Folkestone town and then the channel and on a clear day if you squint you can see France as well. Just down to the right is, as Andrew was referencing, the Cherry Garden Upper Works, and that is actually the original seat of Folkestone Water Company from 1848, I believe. And there is a, as you say, a medieval history, Andrew, but also in the 19th century, I believe Folkestone was one of the first piped water supply areas outside London? It was. Apart from the area of Kent right next to London, yes, this town had one of the first supplies. And do we know why that was? Uh, I think an innovative man came up with the idea and wanted to bring pipe water to the community here. It's been a historical problem, as we'll discuss a bit further, because actually it's very difficult to get fresh water down in Folkestone itself. You've got the rivers, but they fall out into the sea, and if you imagine a community would use that river in various different ways along its length, probably not the cleanest water for drinking. So actually what they found was here at the foot of the downs was that really fresh water coming out of the chalk, and that's what they wanted for their drinking supply. Because all around us is, as you say, white cliffs, and we look over there, and, and you know we can see the the channel. Absolutely, yep. You've got the the Eurostar and the the Eurotunnel terminal here, and then the busiest shipping lane in Europe right there, and all these white cliffs, Andrew. Mm. Well, the the chalk of the North Downs is, as as Beverly said, a really good source of water because it's got its aquifer. So you, basically, we're standing on top of the scarp slope of the North Downs, its steepest parts that face Folkestone, but carry on right across Kent into Surrey. And all along there, along the base of them, are springs of fresh drinking water. So this was a zone that's been occupied by humans right back into prehistory because of the easy access to fresh, clean spring water. Now, I see in front of me a hill and yeah. a winding path. Yeah. Why is it important that we walk up that hill, well, Andrew? First of all, we get a much better view from on top of the whole of Folkestone, and it would be much easier to explain this long story of the problem of how you get the fresh, clean spring water that everybody wants to drink from these hills 
to the actual settlement of Folkestone itself, which is on the coast above Folkestone Harbour. But they had to take the water uphill, basically. It kind of looks like that. You, you know, there is this myth, this legend of Ianswith that she used the power of, her power of God to make water run uphill. But actually, this refers to a really clever piece of engineering using the contours to deliver water to the, the top of the hill at the bale. Um, but of course it never actually runs uphill, it, it follows the contours and very gently runs to that spot. Problems in the past of getting the fresh clean water to the people of Folkestone are the same as today essentially and actually it's much the same geography that's being used and so by climbing up onto this hill which is itself a medieval castle we will be able to get a much better view of the whole of the town and be able to discuss the different sort of aspect of how you get water from one part to another. And could you just briefly tell our listeners the history of Innsworth? Yeah, so Innsworth was the daughter of King Edbald of Kent. So she's probably born in the 630s AD. Gosh, so we're talking that far back. 7th century, yeah. And she founded a, a monastic community at Folkestone on the cliffs overlooking the harbour. That was founded probably in about 660. And unfortunately she then died very young, probably 18, 19 years old, and was buried in that community. And, and then in the 12th century her remains, her relics, were translated into the, the new church that they built there, which is the current parish church. And we were able to establish a couple of years ago with radiocarbon dating that these bones are, are indeed her. They date to that period. It is a young woman, 18, 19 years old. And she was made a saint. She, so she's a saint in Swift. She's effectively the patron saint of Folkestone and she's the daughter of a king of Kent. And I believe you've also found early relics of a water system. The water system, yeah. So there's this, this water course which basically draws on the streams that flow out of the hills here, but it diverted one of those streams into an artificial channel that ran from what is now Moorhall Wreck to the Bale, to the, the medieval priory at the Bale. And this was known for a long time as Ianswith's Water, and it was associated with a medieval legend about her making water run uphill. And a few years ago, working with Beverly and Affinity Water, we, we excavated the course of it on Moorhall Wreck. And what we established is it's not as old as Ianswith. It's had a name attached to it, but it's actually probably 12th century, so the 1100s. I'm not going to quibble with that. No, <laughs> it's no. still yeah. really early, it maybe is. not no, 8th really, century. No. We got out of one of the early phases of the ditch, but because it was basically, in its original form, an open clay-lined ditch... Later on it became, much later on, it became a piped supply. So it's got multiple phases, and one of the earliest phases, or no, not quite the earliest, we got a, ra a bone out of it, which we radiocarbon dated to the late 1200s, so late 13th century. But we think that the earliest phase is probably a 12th century, which is a time when they were building this new Benedictine priory on the bale at Folkestone, which is now the parish church and, and it's likely that the, the borough of Folkestone, the lord of Folkestone, the Benedictine Priors collaborated to undertake this really really significant piece of engineering that basically diverted this stream and was able also to draw on the stream that flows from here at Cherry Garden Hill and the Pent stream itself to divert parts of those waters but it diverted as far as we can tell the entire stream known as the Swiss water into this artificial contour channel that ran for a mile and a half probably across the Folkestone plain and delivered this fresh drinking water to the bale, the historic heart of Folkestone. And that's, you know, for the 12th century, it's a really major piece of engineering, huge investment in labour, all hand dug, of course. But that's just the start of the story because that water course was then maintained sometimes very successfully and sometimes they struggled with it right through until the 20th century it was only finally disconnected as the supply to the bale pond in 1954 and in the early 20th century it was still the only supply of fresh water to some poor cottages obviously by that time 
you had got the modern pipe supplies had started to be installed and some of them we've ascertained run directly down the course of this water course so but for you know nearly 800 years that was the supply of water to the town and the people of Folkestone and a great deal of work and investment went into keeping it operating and keeping it flowing and supplying this fresh water. Water engineering is never easy and, and that was certainly the case when we look at the records of the town of Folkestone. So Ainsworth got it right? She, it would have been a lot easier if she could have just made it, led the stream uphill with the no, power come on, of the Andrew. Lord. But, uh, <laughs> but we haven't uncovered a lot of evidence that that actually happened. So I think, uh, but what, you know, what happened in the 12th century is her remains, her, the relics of this Folkestone saint were still held in great reverence in that priory and her name became attached to it. So this great effort to supply this fresh drinking water so that they didn't have to walk down to the pent stream and draw out probably not very clean water from that this got her name attached to it and of course you know water is essential to life and human existence and so it was appropriate in a way that her name became attached to it as a life-giving source and also the fact that this St Ian'sworth's water it appears on early maps and so on flowed through and to the town helped to keep her name alive in the minds of the people of Folkestone and so she's never really been forgotten by the people of Folkestone and now of course we've established that her relics actually are hers so Folkestone is one of the very few places in the country that has its saints bones in its church. Beverly, as we walk the hill, I will chat to you and we'll pick up again with Andrew in a minute. But you were part of that excavation, Affinity Water sponsoring it. Was it an exciting moment? It was. It really brought to life the problems, as Andrew was saying, about getting fresh water to a community. Um, and lots of the same things our engineers and our staff experience today. You know, we have to maintain our supply, we have to maintain Oops, our mind assets. Out for that tree root, we don't want to <laughs> stumble. But I, I'm it's doing a good job. It's quite steep. 1847, Folkestone, the first piped water supply outside London. But water companies were small. They weren't the, didn't cover the big conurbations that we know today. They covered small areas. That's right. They really were built up from individual towns. So we know that Folkestone had its own supply. We know that Dover followed very quickly after, but that only supplied Dover. Um, and then over time, you see this amalgamation and joining together, partly driven by population and a need to get that water out to the more rural um, settlements in the area. And then obviously you've got the same problems again. We've got a resilience issue. So the the wider you can spread your net in terms of catchment, the more resilient you can make your network, and you can also build on your economies of scale. So we find the same thing today when we look at what we're doing in terms of water resource management. We're working on regional levels now, and that really did start from those first amalgamations and, and looking across the area, how do we make this better, how do we improve, how do we work together, still happening today. And Affinity Water has led the way in the past 18 months over saving water and saving our streams. You mentioned the chalk aquifers being a source of clean, clear water for the region. But it's also important that we as individuals do not consume as much, isn't it? Absolutely critical. I mean, water is absolutely essential for human existence, but also everything in the environment as well, which we completely depend on as human beings. So essential that we really try and leave more water in the environment and waste less ourselves. And yes, we have an amazing campaign, Save Our Streams, over 200,000 sign-ups now, and that gives people really bespoke information about what they can do in their own homes to waste less water. So I'd encourage anyone just to go onto our website, have a look, and really think about how you use water because it is fundamental to all life. Now I know that internally Affinity Water had a challenge with its employees and you won, you managed to cut <laughs> your household water consumption for a week to some minuscule level. I did, it was 18 litres a person we got down to. And, and, and the government's guidelines are now 110 aren't they? That, that's their target, that's right. So we did 18 litres 
and I didn't change my life completely. So I think we can, everybody can do a lot. There's room for improvement. We don't need to keep washing our clothes as often. We don't, no. I dare I say, don't flush the toilet as often. <laughs> have a shower. Have a shower, have a short shower. Have a wash in the sink, like probably my grandparents did and many people before them. We should maybe look at the past a bit more to see how we should behave in the future. Well, if you lead the way, we'll ascend the hill and I'll keep chatting if I can. Now, we've got to go single file up here. I think I'm getting a little heady with the, the height. Do we know how far up we are now on this chalk hill? I can't tell you exactly, but our reservoirs are all up here and that allows us to use the gravity to push water back down to the town. So they really have thought about what's the best place. And if you look just down to your right now, Bonnie... I don't know if I dare look. <laughs> it's quite <laughs> steep, but we're perfectly safe. You can actually see the oh my three goodness. original open reservoirs of the Folkestone Water Company. And they were actually named off the directors of the time. So you've got Hart, Bateman and Spurgeon. The smaller two are actually concealed by the trees at the moment because they're all out in lovely green leaf. But they're not operational anymore but they remain there and those buildings you've got the original stable block up in the top right hand corner and the building range there they were workshops and various things happening there and that was really the heart of the water company in Folkestone as it was and we still own it today incredible and Andrew do you think there's a need to preserve some of this modern history too I do actually I think we can hear the railway just below we can yeah train coming over through the tunnel you know this is one of the earliest modern 19th century waterworks sites in the country. There's a lot of engineering gone on here and it, it's part of the, the long story of trying to deliver fresh, clean water to people here. And it's absolutely part of the archaeology and heritage of the town of Folkestone and something that Folkestone should be proud to have. And I think it's absolutely something that should be preserved as much as we can. I mean, it'd be great one day to see it actually opened up as a heritage centre. And of course, given the long history, the unusually long history of, of water here, I mean, it's primary spring that feeds St Ianswith's water and fed that medieval supply just lies on the other side of Cherry Garden Hill. Uh, yeah, with those trees and that canopy. Yeah, it's kind of, it's actually, the actual spring is actually within the Channel Tunnel complex now, but it comes out under a culvert under the M20 and then it does actually resume as a natural spring and flows pretty much today back into the pent and follows its natural course because it is a natural spring. But what, what happened on Moorhall Wreck, which you can also see from here, that's where they diverted it into this artificial medieval channel. So within really only a few hundred yards, you've got this, this incredible story of the history of the supply of water from the 12th century up to the 19th century. And there's probably nowhere in the country where you've got that story in, in almost in one place. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of potential that could be done here to talk about a really important aspect of Folkestone's history, where Folkestone in both cases was, you know, led the way and was something of a pioneer for how you do this sort of thing. And Beverly, would you like to see it a heritage site? I would love to see something like that happen. I, the other interesting thing about this site is that across the top you've got the North Downs Way and uh, the pilgrimage routes. So this site has actually potential to be a really a, a gateway to these downs and link up to some other amazing, you know, long historic stories and routes that people could enjoy today. We all know it's great for us to be outside in the countryside and there's some real opportunities. Well, let's keep walking. Here we go. One, two, three. Whoa! Gosh, this path is very narrow, isn't it? But actually, oh. I think, you know, most of the people of Folkestone don't come and walk up here, no. you know, to be honest. I mean, it, it, and that's nice in a way because there's never many people up here, but really, it's right on their doorstep and, and in a way it'd be better if more people Well that's why that side yeah. would be such a nice gateway, gateway to it. That's what it needs. Yeah, because you could have... It gives people the confidence then to come up here and yeah. explore. And you could make a, you know, a nice wide yeah. ride through the woodlands. Yeah. No,